Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives, and a special welcome to our YouTube viewers. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today as we welcome former second lady and historian who will share some of her extensive knowledge about the man known as the father of the Constitution. James Madison laid the groundwork for the Constitution in the Federalist Papers, then shaped it in the Constitutional Convention in 1787. He joined the first Congress as a House member from Virginia and drafted what we now know as the Bill of Rights. As Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, he supervised the Louisiana Purchase and succeeded Jefferson as president from 1809 to 1817. And as our fourth president, he presided from a variety of places after the British burned Washington in the War of 1812. Our guest today has much more to tell us about Mr. Madison, but before I introduce her, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, Melissa Gilbert will hold the national launch of her book, My Prairie Cookbook, Memories and Frontier Food from My Little House to Yours. The book includes family recipes inspired by the TV series in which she played Laura Ingalls Wilder. It also includes memories from the popular, um, popular series. The event is related to our Making the Mark exhibit now showing in the O'Brien Gallery. And I bet you didn't know that the Laura Ingalls Wilder collection is in the Harry Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, which is part of the National Archives. On Monday, September 15th at noon, author and historian Todd Brewster will discuss his new book, Lincoln's Gamble. It's an account of the most critical six months of Lincoln's presidency in which he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation and changed the course of the Civil War. To learn more about these and all of our public programs, there are copies of our monthly calendar in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it in the regular mail or by email. And you'll also find brochures about the uh, Foundation for the National Archives which um, the foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities and there are applications for membership also in the lobby. And a little secret that I'll share with you, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the Foundation for the National Archive. <laughs> As chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Lynn Cheney wrote and spoke about how important it is to teach children about history, the leaders, events, and ideas that have shaped our world. She also worked to provide opportunities for teachers to gain in-depth knowledge, the in-depth knowledge they need to provide that inspired instruction. Currently, as a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, she emphasizes the value of knowing American history so that we understand how precious and fragile our freedom is. To quote her, reading history makes it clear that the life we enjoy isn't inevitable. Understanding how rare and precious liberty is underscores the importance of defending it. She, she has produced six best-selling history books for children and their families. In We the People, the story of the Constitution, released in 2008, she recounted the story of the making of our Constitution and the men, including George Washington, James Madison, and Benjamin Franklin involved, and now James Madison, A Life Reconsidered. Mrs. Cheney earned her bachelor's degree with highest honors from Colorado College, her master's from the University of Colorado, and her doctorate with a specialization in 19th century British literature from the University of Wisconsin. She is the recipient of awards and honorary degrees from dozens of colleges and universities. One of the joys of, as, of being archivist of the United States is to welcome to our stage researchers who have used the records of the National Archives in the creation of new scholarship and I'm really pleased to welcome this researcher, Lynn Cheney. Thank you, I made it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I can't quite see the front row. Um, sometimes this is called the Queen Elizabeth problem. Do you remember when she came during, you probably don't, the bicentennial of the Constitution, all you could see was her purple hat. So uh, if you're in the front row and uh, uh, you want to see as well as hear, this is your chance. I really appreciate your being here today. I, I love this program that the Archives has of uh, bringing in, in speakers on uh, relevant uh, topics. 
um, to to talk to people uh, during uh, a lunch hour. I uh, will recommend that they get a little step stool for the next really short person. And I have one other recommendation, which I've been making privately, but I'm going to make it publicly now, that we need to get more in the archives about the framers of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution. I would like children to know when they come here, young people, adults, how, uh, how amazing an accomplishment, um, I know most about the Constitution, how amazing an accomplishment the Constitution was, how uh, hard Madison worked, how um, crucial he was. I am sometimes asked why I would spend five years writing about one person. And I say, well, you know, it wasn't just any person. It was uh, a person who did more, I think, than anyone else to create the country that we know today. That is no small claim and no small achievement. And we are extremely fortunate that uh, there were men of uh, Madison's learning and genius um, there at the time when uh, the framework for the government was being formed. Here we go, solving the problem. <laughs> Well, this is a nice, sturdy little help up. I have uh, stood on many things in my career. Um, I've discovered that two reams of paper works pretty well, but it's kind of slippery. I want, the worst thing I ever stood on was a little, one of those laundry basket things that college students like, you know. But of course, you can't just stand on it, so somebody um, duct taped a cafeteria tray to the top of it. <laughs> So this is really quite nice, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the archives uh, uh, having, uh, uh, having this little facility for me, this little uh, elevation. I was once photographed standing on top of a briefcase by my hometown newspaper, and they uh, headlined the picture, She Delivers Elevated Remarks. <laughs> so uh, I will try to live up to that, uh, to that description. But, you know, Madison, what, what a story to tell. And uh, I thought the story needed told because he wasn't sufficiently appreciated. I think maybe we don't appreciate any of the uh, founders, the framers, enough. But in Madison's case, it seemed particularly uh, egregious. He uh, was ranked in one poll uh, conducted among academics, uh, one poll that ranked presidential uh, accomplishments that ranked presidents um, as somewhere behind Grover Cleveland, you know, which in, in my opinion is just, uh, I was aghast when I saw that. So uh, why Madison for five years? Just think of his accomplishments. It was he who did more than anybody else to get the Constitutional Convention underway. He got Washington to attend. Um, Washington was reluctant. He did not know if it would succeed, and so he was holding back. But Madison told him how many uh, other great men were coming, and that gave Washington assurance. Through a snowstorm, Madison rode to New York to make sure that the uh, Confederation Congress didn't act in ways that would hinder the formation of the Constitutional Convention. He arrived earlier than any other state, uh, any other out-of-state delegate in Philadelphia where the convention was held, and he used the time to write the agenda for the Constitutional Convention, the agenda known as the Virginia Plan. He was a superb politician, and he understood that you can't get anything done by yourself. So part of the reason for being there early was to get other uh, delegates, as they came into town, on board with uh, his agenda. All of that and that was his preparation for the convention. Um, once the convention was underway, uh, Madison not only you know, tried to get as much of his agenda enacted as possible, he spoke almost as much as any other delegate at the convention, while at the same time he was taking shorthand notes of what everyone was saying. He would go home at night and transcribe these notes and the result is a national treasure that is uh, uh, our real, only real insight into what went on in this convention that was, uh, for the most part, well, 
it was a secret. People were not supposed to uh, divulge what was going on outside the uh, convention hall, Independence Hall, we call it now. And I think they may have started that even by the time of the Constitution. So spoke more, almost more than anyone else, uh, kept a record of the events. Um, once the Constitution was signed, he got together with Alexander Hamilton and with a little help from John Jay, wrote the Federalist Papers, which were the case for the Constitution. Um, there's some argument among scholars about how important the Federalist Papers were in swaying hearts and minds. But I'm convinced they had great importance in what was probably the most important of the ratifying convention, the one in Virginia. Madison made sure that copies of the Federalist uh, were sent ahead. And what that accomplished was giving people who knew they were for the Constitution but hadn't quite articulated their thinking, it gave them the arguments to use in the convention. Um, so you can think of this event, the ratifying convention in Virginia, as uh, an event in which Madison's voice was echoing from every direction on, on the floor. He also spoke eloquently himself and uh, w is um, widely uh, thought by his contemporaries to have won ratification by defeating the most important and accomplished orator of the day, Patrick Henry, who had no use for the Constitution. But Virginia ratified. The Federalist um, helped it uh, helped the Constitution be ratified in New York, surely, where the original ones uh, appeared. Just think of all he's done just to this point. You know, he got the convention going. He's uh, the leading figure at the convention. He's the leading figure in ratification, and then he becomes the leading figure in the new government. Now, you might think it was George Washington, and of course it was. It was Washington. But Madison was Washington's chief advisor. Um, when Washington asked one of his aides to write uh, an inaugural address for him, the aide produced, I think it was a 78-page um, monstrosity, really. And Washington understood this wouldn't work, so he turned to Madison. And Madison wrote George Washington's inaugural address. Um, Patrick Henry had seen to it that Madison wasn't in the Senate of the United States. He, the Virginia legislature, which appointed senators, um, Henry had enough control over that to make sure Madison wasn't a senator. He tried, him to, he tried to keep him from being a representative. He convinced a young man named James Monroe to run against him. Um, and he gerrymandered. That's a, an anachronism since gerrymandering hadn't uh, been named yet. It would be named after El Elbridge Gerry. But he gerrymandered the district, so it was a disadvantage to Madison. But Madison prevailed, and he became the leader of the House of Representatives, where um, he uh, performed uh, magnificently, uh, not only you know, writing the uh, House's response to Washington's inaugural address, but at Washington's request, Madison also wrote Washington's response to the House's response and to the Senate's response. So, you know, just you begin to get a feeling of how influential and important, uh, important he was. One of the interesting facts of history is that Madison didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. He thought that the Constitution uh, did nothing to um, take away the people's uh, unalienable rights, that we had these rights. They were fundamental. Uh, they belonged to each of us. And all the Constitution did was give the government a limited number of enumerated powers. You know, it didn't suggest any place, for example, that um, the government uh, had the power uh, to suppress uh, speech. It didn't suggest anywhere the Constitution. It didn't suggest that government had the power to regulate religion. And so Madison and many others at the time as well didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. But in the end, he, uh, he introduced a Bill of Rights in the first session of the uh, first Congress. And he did so knowing that it was important to knit the nation together, that it was uh, crucial that states like North Carolina, who had been uh, reluctant to ratify, uh, that, that those states be brought on board and that the, the union uh, be knit together. He also 
figured out a way to make the Bill of Rights um, a document, or to make these amendments, um, to form them in a way that wouldn't suggest that Congress had ever had the right to suppress speech, for example. If you, if you look at the way Madison wrote the amendments, it's very artful. You know, he says, the government shall not infringe upon, or the right of the people to shall not be denied. Every one of the Bill of Rights and Madison's uh, uh, draft of them, every one of them assumed that we had these rights, but here we were just going to say, don't mess with them. So that, in a way, was a, a kind of breakthrough thinking that makes Madison such an important historical figure. You know, he, 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 he saw that we didn't need them, but once he understood that we did need them for the unity of the nation, he figured out a way to word them so that uh, they didn't suggest that Congress, that the federal government had the right um, to take away rights of any kind. Um, well, his career in Congress was, was a remarkable one. And then he became Jefferson's Secretary of State. And uh, as uh, the archivist told you, he uh, oversaw the Louisiana Purchase, no small accomplishment, you know, doubling the size of the United States. Sort of an interesting historical um, telling of uh, what happened um, at the Louisiana Purchase is that Jefferson got cold feet. He decided that maybe it wasn't constitutional for him to buy all of Louisiana. Oh, he worried about it. He said, well, if Louisiana today, why not Holland tomorrow? And um, Madison, who was you know, a very strict constructionist of the Constitution, thought that you know, Jefferson had just you know, gone a little, little crazy over this, that there was no reason in the world that buying Louisiana uh, wasn't included under the president's treaty power, which is in fact what the Louisiana Purchase was. It was a treaty that uh, was signed by the president and uh, ratified by the Senate. He thought that, and he also pointed out to Jefferson that the Constitution provided for new states. And where were the new states supposed to come from if the president didn't already have the, uh, the right to acquire territory? So again, he steps up and plays a crucial role. He was the first president, when he became president, to take the nation to war under the Constitution. And though that war was one that uh, had uh, uh, grievous side effect, Washington was burned, as I'm sure all of you who live here know, uh, just about 200 years ago, it was on August 14th that the British arrived and set the torch to the public buildings, the Capitol, White House. Um, Patton office escaped. Um, you would think that would ruin a president, wouldn't you? Well, it didn't. Um, Madison responded with such cool courage, um, such a calming uh, demeanor, that at the end of his presidency, when the Treaty of Ghent ending the War of 1812 had been signed, and when Jackson had had that remarkable victory in New Orleans um, after the Treaty of Ghent, but a victory that uh, showed the world how fine American military power could be. At the end of his presidency, Madison was beloved. And it's almost hard for us these days to understand that since you know, presidents who serve eight years um, usually end up not beloved. You have to uh, uh, go away for a while and rebuild your reputation. But Madison's reputation was there from the beginning. His countrymen um, loved him. I can't. Um, uh, conclude a presentation of Madison's many accomplishments uh, without mentioning um, his uh, friend, he called her, his beloved, he called her Dolly Madison. She was quite amazing. Madison uh, was a bachelor for a very long time. And one day he saw, her name then was the widow Todd. She had recently been widowed in uh, the yellow fever epidemic that uh, uh, nearly destroyed Philadelphia in 1793. She survived, and one of her babies survived, um, though not her husband and the other child. But he saw the widow Todd walking down the streets of Philadelphia, and he was, how do the British say it, gobsmacked? He was, he was smitten. Um, she was beautiful. She was tall and shapely. She had dark hair, 
a fair skin that her mother had taught her to protect from the sun, you know, blue eyes, ruby red lips, she was the whole package. And Madison was not the first person to fall in love with her, but he managed uh, to arrange a meeting. And in one of those funny little things that happen in history, he arranged a meeting through a Princeton classmate of his, a fellow named Aaron Burr. <laughs> Burr knew uh, the widow Todd, and he got the, uh, her to agree to a meeting with Madison. And Dolly um, appeared in a mulberry satin dress and yellow glass beads, and uh, James was convinced. So they were married a few months later. I have always been a little bit of a skeptic about how much a political wife uh, activities matter. You know, just don't get your husband in trouble is sort of my, <laughs> my thinking on the subject. But Dolly was definitely an asset. Washington, in 1800, when the Madisons came here, he to be Secretary of State, was a very unpleasant place. There were a few houses, um, and the Madisons managed to snag one on F Street. But most members of Congress uh, lived in boarding houses that were small and miserable. Uh, one, of, one congressman said it's, like, it's living like bears, and all we do is talk politics from morning till night. But Dolly um, opened the doors to their F Street house, invited everybody. She didn't care if you were a Federalist or a Republican, come over, have some good comfort food, enjoy yourself. And uh, she saw herself, I think, as part of the entertainment. She had these fantastic outfits. Uh, one that strikes me still is a, a pink velvet uh, dress with ermine trim, a, a great white turban with a peacock feather um, out of it, lots of gold chains. Now, people were enchanted, enchanted by her. This helped James, there's no doubt about it. He was a reserved fellow. But this showed him at his best, you know, a convivial host with his lovely, uh, lovely wife. And there, there even, there's even a letter, maybe more than one, um, from members of Congress saying what an asset she was in the presidential nominating process of uh, 1808. The Congress, the caucuses in the Congress in those days, chose the nominees. So when people thought of James Madison, they thought of not only his vast intellect, not only his remarkable experience and his many achievements, they, they thought of him with the enveloping warmth of that house that uh, Dolly was hostess of. So he was uh, lucky in marriage. Uh, he was uh, fortunate to have lived at a time when his talents were in demand. You know, I've often wondered what would have happened if Bill Gates had been born in 1900. You know, these are remarkable talents, but they weren't in demand. And here's Madison with this, this uh, insight, uh, this experience in the art of politics and, and governance. He, was, he lived at exactly the right time, a time that must have been thrilling for him. He also, another of his uh, attributes, is that he worked harder than anyone I have ever read or written about. You know, getting to the Constitutional Convention early was part of it, but he was always reading, always thinking, uh, looking ahead. And I, I guess the uh, conclusion to this would be, as fortunate as he was to have lived when he did and to have accomplished as much as he did, we are, uh, we are the ones most fortunate because of the framework he established for this great country. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to take questions. Ah, there's, there are microphones. I was supposed to remind you of that. Yes, sir. Is this, is it, yeah, it's working. Um, my belief is that most of us are contradictions and to some degree perhaps hypocritical. Madison and slavery. I think he regarded it as his greatest personal failing. Um, he and Jefferson were both eloquent about the immorality of slavery. They knew it was wrong. Jefferson was also eloquent about the danger it posed to the Union. He called the uh, Missouri Compromise a fire bell in the night. You know, the, the conflagration is, uh, is coming. But they couldn't figure out how to get out of it. You know, that doesn't seem like a worthy excuse, 
But you go through Madison's, and it's not, that's not because slavery is so wrong. But by the time Madison was growing old and thinking about you know, what, how his estate should be disposed, it was almost impossible to free a slave. Um, Virginia had uh, made laws that a freed slave had to be removed from the state. Um, surrounding states had made laws that freed slaves couldn't come there. For a while, freed slaves from Virginia could go to Illinois, but then later on, uh, not. Madison became part of an organization called the American Colonization Society, the idea of which was that freed slaves uh, could be uh, transported to Africa, to, to Liberia. Well, it, it was not it was not sensible. It wasn't reasonable. Madison was so smart he had to know it. You know, there were there were so many slaves who who regarded Virginia as home, for example. The families at Montpelier went back as far as uh, Madison's families, uh, Madison's family in Virginia. So, you know, slaves freed didn't want to go to Liberia. It cost a lot. The American Colonization Society could never raise enough money to, uh, to send um, every slave, should they be freed, uh, to Africa. So I, I look on his clinging to this as a kind of desperation. He couldn't figure out, couldn't figure out how to get out of it. This was the only thing he found. He knew it didn't make sense. But I think he died uh, knowing that this was a place where he had failed. He'd said early in his life that he wanted to find a way to live without the labor of slaves, and he never did. And Jefferson never did. And Washington didn't. And uh, Monroe didn't either. So the, the Virginia presidents, the first four Virginia presidents, uh, it, was, it was a great failing. I'm sorry, I'm being pointed this way. Would you like to ask? I'm a college student, and ever since I was very, very young, I've always been very interested in history. I've always been very interested in history. As a matter of fact, when I was nine years old, I read David McCullough's biography of Adams cover to cover. My question is, um, what do you think is especially important today for young people to know about the early years of our country's history? Well, thank you for uh, being a student of history. I. Uh you're such a baby. I think how old I was when I read David McCullough, but I'm glad you did it at nine years old and, uh, and keep going. Um, it's one of my great worries that uh, we don't teach history to our children in a way that interests them and that we're increasingly not doing it at all. That, um, you know, the emphasis on the Common Core curriculum, for example, is on reading critically. And that's great, and the curriculum promises that there'll be some of the founding documents that the students will learn to read critically. But I have to say, the Constitution doesn't mean as much as it should to a child, to an ordinary person, unless you have the context. You know, unless someone is teaching uh, how with the Declaration, for example, the men who put their name to the document were risking their lives. They knew they could be hanged if this didn't work out, and the odds were it wasn't going to work out. So there was bravery there, the genius of Madison, the hard work of Madison, um, the persistence of the framers. All of those things, I think, we need to teach our children, you know, in addition to how to read these documents uh, critically. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of it. So it's been a been kind of a hobby horse of mine for a long time. I wrote children's books in part um, to give parents a way to teach history to their children. And I hope that by writing the Madison biography, um, I'm able to put a little context around the uh, uh, magnificent documents that are displayed here in the archives. Thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. Legal scholars have always been bothered that there isn't enough written about the deliberations on either the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, and, and Madison took notes. Did he have a, obviously he wasn't supposed to, was this a legal thing that he violated? Was it some just oral agreement that we're just not going to do notes? How much trouble could he have gotten into for doing his notes? 
Well, Washington had made it pretty clear that uh, you know this, these proceedings were secret. Uh, one day, somebody dropped a paper uh, in the Constitutional Convention, and Washington picked it up and just sort of looked over at the delegates, and everyone shuddered because Washington had that much authority in a in a glance. But Washington knew what Madison was doing. Um, Madison sat right up at the front next to Washington to do it. There was also a secretary there, but basically he just said, you know, at 9 o'clock they met, and then at 4 o'clock they adjourned, that kind of thing. But there was an agreement that the notes wouldn't be made public until after the uh, people at the convention uh, died. And uh, Madison was the last to die. And uh, so upon his death, then they there was nothing. Um, I think it would have just been a matter of honor before to not reveal them. Yes. So early on, you, you mentioned the uh, ranking of the presidents where Madison was ranked behind Grover Cleveland. So I guess looking at it from a contrary standpoint, what are the mistakes that Madison made as president? What are the opportunities missed that might have caused his ranking to go lower, not just singing the, his praises? You know, I don't think that those things exist. Not that he didn't make mistakes. Of course he made mistakes. But when you think of his contributions, I would put Madison maybe right behind George Washington. It's um, hard to conceive of anything, anyone but Washington, you know, being, uh, being number one. But uh, I, I can't think of great mistakes. He was a wonderful president. Um, he was committed to freedom of speech. He fought the Alien and Sedition Acts. The mistake, the ultimate failing, was slavery. That's that's how I think of uh, I think of Madison. He judged some people wrongly. You know, I guess that's uh, that's a failing. He put his faith in people who didn't uh, always live up um, to uh, to what he had expected. But I think that happens to every president. Had a little trouble with his cabinet, but that happens. I, I, at one point in the book, I noted that his response to uh, uh, fighting, internal infighting in his cabinet, was to try to ignore it and rise above it, which is a tactic that many presidents have tried and a few have succeeded with. So I, I don't have a very good answer for your question, but thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. How would you explain what seems to me to be a continuing fact that Thomas Jefferson outshines in the national mind the accomplishments of Madison. Seems to me that Madison far outshines Jefferson's accomplishments in the final analysis. What do you think? Well, I think so too, but I think you can't deny the advantage to being tall. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, true uh, now as it was then. I do remember in the 76 debate that the Carter forces thought it was such a, a disadvantage for him to be shorter than Gerald Ford that they actually convinced Gerald Ford to stand in a hole. Um, he, shouldn't have, he shouldn't have gone along with that. Um, there's also something we like. We like to read about characters who, are, who have pretty big flaws. You know, those are pretty interesting characters, the ones that are enormously flawed. They have, you know, good gossip behind them. Um, as the archivist mentioned, I, I was an English major uh, for years and years and years. And one of the great questions that English majors always ask, it has to do with Milton's Paradise Lost, is why is the devil more interesting than God? You know, and it's the same thing, that, that it is more interesting, because the devil's always plotting and, you know, it just kind of arouses your, uh, uh, your curiosity. So maybe that's part of it. Um, Jefferson, as we know, um, well, and as, as I learned so much about, he was so uh, soaring in his thought, you know, and inspiring. But sometimes it just didn't make sense. Um, and he was lucky to have Madison as a friend because Madison brought him back to Earth. They had this one debate in which Jefferson declared that we needed to totally change the government, totally renew the government every 19 years. And the reason for that was that he calculated that that was the age of a generation, 19 years, and that nobody should have to live with the laws of the dead, that the earth belonged to the living. 
And so this was his plan, and he laid it out at great length in a letter. And Madison wrote back, and with the, as much tact as you can possibly imagine, as politely as you can, can think, he pointed out that, well, if you calculate a generation at 19 years, that's fine, but they didn't all drop dead at once. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were new ones coming along and older ones dying, and so the scheme just wasn't very workable. So I don't know. Maybe Jefferson's flaws make him more interesting, but I do think the height is really important. Uh, yes? There is the Madison of the Constitutional Convention, the Madison of the, Nulla, of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and Madison in his final years in, with, in the controversy with, with Calhoun about what was original intent. Do you see any absolute consistency, or did Madison respond to the crises of the day with new thoughts and um, changed opinions? Um, you know, it's a little of both. Uh, the Madison of the Constitution was worried about the states. He looked at uh, Virginia and saw religious freedom being suppressed. You know, Baptists were beaten and jailed. He looked at Rhode Island and saw this uh, cockamamie financial system where the legislature would print money when it needed it. And of course, that led to inflation, and shopkeepers wouldn't keep it, wouldn't take the money, so the legislature passed a law forcing them to. They were, the states were conducting their own foreign policies. They were trying to tax neighboring states. At the Constitutional Convention, Madison's main concern was a central government strong enough so that the states didn't pull the Union apart. Then he met Alexander Hamilton. And uh, at first, they worked well together at, the, at writing the Federalist Papers together. But then, when Hamilton became Secretary of Treasury, it was quite clear that his understanding of the Constitution was very different from Madison's that Hamilton saw the Constitution as a document that permitted the federal government to undertake whatever was in the general welfare, which meant anything. Madison understood that as rhetoric left over from the Articles of Confederation. No, in Madison's view, this was a government that had very clearly specified powers and not very many of them. So, in the beginning, the danger, as Madison saw it, was with the states, and you needed a strong central government. But then the danger became too strong a central government. So, you know, you can say Madison changed his mind, but when the situation changes that radically, I think it it's, uh, would be folly not to. And uh, so he became um, an advocate of uh, the central government staying in its place and uh, the states um, uh, having uh, more power than he had originally contemplated. Now, let's see, what else? Oh, the resolutions. Well, the idea that the central government shouldn't become too powerful was reinforced more and more for him during the Adams administration. When there was a law passed that anyone who um, offered a, you know, a rigorous criticism of the government was guilty of sedition and could be thrown in jail. Um, many congressmen, or several congressmen, are thrown in jail. Newspaper editors were thrown in jail. And Madison, at that point, wrote the uh, Virginia Resolutions, in which he said that uh, when the government does something that's unconstitutional, the states have the right to, and his word was, interpose. Now, Jefferson went further and said, nullify. And Madison spent much of his life trying to walk... Uh, walk back that phrase of Jefferson's, because Madison didn't think that a state could nullify, but he did think that they could make a fuss, interpose, try to change public opinion. And uh, I, I see that as a continuation of his, uh, his idea that, uh, you know, while you don't want the states to be too powerful, that um, the real threat he saw in his more mature years was a federal government that could be oppressive. Okay. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. I appreciate it and look forward to having you sign my copy of your book. Good. <laughs> Buy many for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> my question is about the Bill of Rights, and it might be a bit simplistic. 
Um, when you go up to the rotunda and look at it, it appears there are 12. Mm -hmm. Am I seeing things incorrectly or is there an explanation? Well, in the beginning there were 17. Right. Uh, Madison, the primary author of the Bill of Rights, had 17, including one. Remember, this is the time when he's still really worried about the states including one which gave the Congress the right to nullify a state law. Um, the House passed the amendment, sent them to the Senate. They pared them down uh, to 12. The First Amendment wasn't the First Amendment that we think of. The first one, I see Jackie Bedell right behind you, the first one had to do with representation in Congress, um, that the uh, Congress ought to be able to change the ratio of representation so that the body wouldn't get out of hand. As the population grew, you needed to change the ratio to keep the size of the body uh, down. And the second one had to do with Congress not being able to pass a pay raise for it uh, without uh, an ensuing election, without an election uh, coming between. Those two didn't make it through. Um, the others did. The First Amendment became the First Amendment. And finally, the one about pay raises did become law. Tell me when, Jackie. I'm sorry, I don't remember. 1992. 1992. Okay, thank you very much. So all those years later, that, that amendment was finally ratified by the states. So that's the answer. That's a good, clear-cut answer. Thanks. For that. Gosh, you put me on the spot there for a second. Sorry, I didn't remember the year. Um, I am, first of all, congratulations on this work. It is viewed now as kind of the most heralded work on Madison's life, so congratulations to you. And that kind of leads to my question because I know how much hard work goes into creating the work and researching it. So I wondered if you could give us a better sense of just how long the process is to do the research versus how long it is to actually do the writing. And then I'd love to know actually which one you enjoy more. <laughs> well, Jacqueline is an expert. Um, there's expertise behind this question because I bothered her for five years. <laughs> you know, there were some documents I just couldn't get out of the archives on my own. It, so much of it's available online, but, you know, Jacqueline knew the right keys to press. So um, I, I'm so grateful for your help. You know, I, I mentioned I was an English major, so I spent a long part of my life telling freshmen how to write essays and uh, term papers, and here were the rules. You get some note cards, and you go to the library, and you start taking notes on your cards, and you don't put any more than one idea on a card, or you'll get confused. And then you get all your cards together, and you make an outline, and then you write. Well, that isn't the truth. That's, I don't know, maybe somebody can write that way, but, uh, you know, I thought I was doing them a favor, but, you know, the process I find is you read, and you read, and you read, and you read. And you kind of get an, you know, a broad, general idea of what you're doing. And then you sit down to write. And, you know, you've probably got, I don't take notes very much. I print things out on my printer uh, when I come across them online or I make copies um, when, they're, when they're not online. But you sit down to write, and by the time you have gotten to about the third sentence, you'll figure out something you didn't, don't know you know, in, in the Madison book. Well, what was the weather like when he arrived in Philadelphia on May 5th, 1787? And uh, what, what did the town look like? What did he see as he made it from the stagecoach uh, stage stop to uh, the boarding house he stayed in? And, you know, you understand then how really interesting these questions are. It happened to be raining. There was a thunderstorm. Um, he would have walked through... Um, the market uh, on Market Street, uh, which was uh, very busy in the middle of the day. By the time he walked through, business was winding down, and besides, it was raining. So you, know, you, you then look for those things. I will tell you that I like the research more than the writing. Um, somebody I, I know or I've read about said that, you know, every word on the paper, you know, was kind of written in blood because it's so hard to get to the right place. And it's revising and revising and revising and revising. Whereas the research is more like a mystery. You know, you have a question, and then it is so exciting when you find the answer. But thank you for your help, and thanks to the archives for uh, being this vast treasure house for the American people, for people of the world. 
thank you for answering the question. And even though perhaps the research might seem more exciting than the writing, the fact that um, when you read that book, you are in the scene, really experiencing what it was like is really extraordinary. So um, well, thank I you. love you the know, I think that some people that comes naturally to, I have to work really hard to get there. <laughs> I have a follow-up question on your research, which again, thank you so much. It's so extensive. I feel like if I'm where my daughter, who's 12, is doing a report on Madison, I have a great place to send her. I did take her to Montpelier this summer, you have to know, and she really did enjoy it. Oh, good. Um, so my question is, in talking about his relationship with Thomas Jefferson, I was curious why your source for Thomas Jefferson in his relationship with the Hemings family was the book by Gordon Reed, which appears to be more of a novel than nonfiction. You know, there was great scholarly outcry when uh, the idea that... Uh, uh, Jefferson had had a relationship um, with uh, Sally Hemings was uh, claimed. And I think I was probably among the outraged. How could you say this about a national treasure? But now I believe it. And I think it is, you know, documented in, in many ways. Um, one, in Sally's uh, descendants. But secondly, just in the human story. You know, Jefferson had lost a wife that he loved beyond measure. And he apparently promised her he would never marry again. And he didn't marry again. And I think Sally Hemings, you know, from all appearances, uh, she was not a victim in the relationship, though I suppose when there's a difference in status, that's always a problem. So, you know, the story, I think, has convinced most scholars. I know there are still people writing, writing the opposite. I do tell a story in my book about Dolly who, like most Southern women, was no doubt taught to ignore master-slave relationships. If you read uh, Mary Chestnut's diary from the Civil War, for example, you realize how common um, these relationships were between masters and uh, slave women. Um, but, you know, Southern women were taught to look the other way. And I, I, there's one point where I think Dolly might just have got tired of that. Um, she went to visit uh, Jefferson, and uh, Sally was, depending on how you tell the story, Sally was pregnant, and uh, Mrs. Madison offered her, she said, I'll give you a gift if you'll name the baby after my husband. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm looking at this too closely, but all of Sally's children were named after people important to Jefferson. And so I think Dolly was saying, hey, maybe time you named one after his best friend. While at the same time, she was revealing her knowledge of the situation. She wasn't quite looking the other way. So I, I'm among the convinced, but I know there are some who aren't. Yes. What was the problem with Patrick Henry? that uh, there was a, uh, apparently a falling out between them? Well, Patrick Henry didn't like the Constitution. Um, he, uh, in a famous phrase, he said, it squints of monarchy. It squints at monarchy. He thought it made too strong a central government, and he didn't want any part of it. Um, he was a rigorous and feared opponent um, I don't think there ever was really a reconciliation uh, between the uh, uh, pro-constitutionalists like Madison and, uh, and Henry. But his story is a remarkable one. Uh, you know, what an orator. What, uh, what a gift of uh, uh, prose he, he brought to the nation. So it was basically that. It was about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think I've satisfied everyone's... Uh, questions. What's my next job here? Okay, and where do I do it? Right here? Oh, okay. Well, I'd be happy to sign any books, and if you have three or four, I don't mind. 